Hello, my name is Gina Rex, and I am the education lead with the Aero Food Institute at the University of Guelph. Welcome to AFI's webinar on conversations about school food. In conversations about school food, we center around the fundamental belief that we as a society, as a community, need to find ways to improve food access and food security for everyone. In engaging in a conversation about this challenge we face and in transforming the food system more broadly, we must acknowledge the land from which this food comes. The land we are meeting on today resides in, in the ancestral and treaty lands of several indigenous peoples, including the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Attawandaran people. We want to honor and respect the precious food sources cultivated, harvested, and gathered by these indigenous peoples and remain grateful to them for their connectedness to this land and their food traditions. This acknowledgement is made with an acceptance of the responsibility that we all have to repair these relationships with the indigenous peoples and with this land. Uh, I have a few housekeeping um, items uh, as participants think of questions, we, we welcome questions. We're, we're going to ask you to place them in the Q&A, &E, um, the box, and then we will have time at the end of the webinar for questions. I will be co-moderating today with Amberly Ruetz, who will join us now. Hi. Hi, Amberly. Amberly is an Aero Scholar alumna. Uh, joined as an Aero Scholar in the inaugural year of, of the Institute. So she's actually been a part of AFI longer than me and, and many of our staff. So um, a, a true veteran of AFI's mission. Uh, she's a school food researcher who has tirelessly been working nationally and internationally to advance school pro food programming in Canada since 2015. Amberly just returned from Paris where she attended the Global School Food Summit. Amberly has a video to share with us uh, about school, about a particular school food program in British Columbia. Can you tell us a little bit about it before we run the video? Absolutely. So I wanted to share this video today about a program in Vancouver because I really think it exemplifies a great youth led school food program. And it really showcases what a national food program could look like. And it showcases the many facets of the power of school food programming and really speaks from a youth perspective about why it means so much to these youth. So now we're gonna roll the video. So it's almost time for the kids to come in for lunch. Can you hear that? We never tell them what it is because we want them to be open to try anything new. The way that schools are, are structured really encourage students to see food as kind of a byproduct in, in the school day. Canada is one of the only uh, developed countries that does not have a federal nutrition program in schools of any variety. So there's communities where there's amazing things happening, but mostly that's not the case. And I think that's the urgency. The opportunity we have here at school is to develop those healthy eating habits, not just about what they eat, but how they eat, and feel confident in preparing food and eating food and in trying new things. All this plant in the garden with purple flowers. See if you can find them. You see it? We got a ladybug. Ladybugs often distract us. I am in a unique position. I teach edible education as a prep. So I have the opportunity to teach every single student in the school once a week. Okay. We need to pull up the plant, and then where are the actual potatoes going to be? What are these? Potatoes. They're a type of potato called warba potatoes. We're seeing potatoes. this trend exist in society where children are more and more disconnected from where their food comes from. You get them in the garden, and they'll, they'll, they'll munch on kale, they'll eat lettuce, they'll pick peas, they'll harvest potatoes, and it just becomes natural. And Lunch Lab really builds off of that. So food has always been a, a real passion of mine, and I actually came back to teaching from a different career. Met Chef TJ, 
who is a parent here at the school. And we started having conversations with Growing Chefs and Fresh Roots, which are two awesome and innovative nonprofits here in Vancouver, and began to dream what could a lunch program look like and how deeply could we get students involved in that. I want to now move on to some of the favorite things that you, that you learned in Lunch Lab. I'm going to go one by one this time, actually. Probably how exhausting yet fun it is to feed 200 people. Yeah, I agree with you. Lunch Lab is a fun and educational program that allows grade six and seven students to be involved as chefs in preparing a meal for their peers. We train about 80 students a year and they have the awesome opportunity to be able to work alongside chefs to learn skills of communication, knife and food safety, around how to work as a team. We're on our 13th try, guys. And that becomes something that they, week after week, become more confident in. That means it's ready. I didn't ever think that just a bunch of kids could feed 200 students, so it's kind of cool. When you make it yourself, it tastes better. Yeah. yeah. I think this is good. <laughs> My favorite thing is like working together with all the students and you know working with chefs and learning a lot more about like kitchen rules and safety and creating food for other people that they enjoy eating. I really enjoy that. <laughs> the difference we see when students first come in, sometimes literally holding the knife upside down, where by the end, they know exactly what they're doing. It's all about getting it to be fun, communal. We all eat together. Students have choice. They can take the time they need. We deliberately give them more time. Lunch should be the most exciting part of a school day. And, and having that ability to just enjoy a meal together, I think is so much of, of what it is to be human. It's hard to express quickly why school food matters because it, it touches on so many different parts of our society. There's health, there's education, there's food security, food sovereignty, the environment, community economic development. There's all these pieces that school food can impact and will impact. The Coalition for Healthy School Food is the largest school food network in Canada, made up of over 260 nonprofit organizations from coast to coast to coast. And collectively, the coalition is advocating for public investment in a universal healthy school food program that would ensure all K-12 students have access to healthy food at school every day. I think Lunch Lab is, yeah, one of the kind of exemplary programs in BC or across Canada, showcasing the potential for what school food can look like in the future with public investment. Uh, Lunch Lab is an awesome place to try new things and meet new people, and it's like always different foods and stuff like, and I think it's an awesome place. You really should come here because it has excellent food. It's always nice to have more friends and to try different foods, and you'll learn a lot. There's lots of cultures and like different kinds of food. It's foods from every country sometimes. And it's really cool because some of these foods I've never tried before. Coconut pineapple curry, I didn't think I'd ever like that. <laughs> and it sounded really gross to begin with, but I tried it and it actually tastes really nice. You spent so much time preparing everything. And then when you get to try it, it's like, wow, this is really good. And it was made by 12 year olds. Up until this year, school food programs have been run through kind of a patchwork of funding and a school champion that has seen a need and started a program up from scratch. This year, 2023, is the first time we've seen dedicated funding for school meal programs in the BC budget. And this is the largest single investment in school food in Canadian history. And it's a really exciting time to see our collective advocacy spark something huge. Lunch Lab is possible because of how amazing this community is. Whether that's the chefs, whether that's the students, whether that's the parents. And I think this is where school districts need to work with the community that they have to imagine programs that are not just feeding children, 
but are engaging children, that are giving students an opportunity to have a voice. And I think that's a bit of a radical educational idea. And I'm really hopeful to see how Lunch Lab can contribute to that movement here in BC. Well, those students' testimonials alone, I found so heartwarming, but very motivational, inspirational too. Like, what a great program. Um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your background, Amberly, um, in, in particular in, in the realm of school food and your related research? Happy to. Yeah, so my journey in the world of school food programming really dates back to 2015 when I was actually a practitioner in the Ontario Student Nutrition Program. And from there, I learned so many things and also had a bunch of questions that arose. So then I transitioned into the research side of school food programming. And, you know, I do a variety of things, but I'm really interested in things like the opportunities and barriers of working with local food producers and distributors on linking up schools and farms. I'm really interested in different best practice models similar to documenting what's going on in BC with that program. And I've also been documenting the growing scope of school meal programs in Canada doing a, a biannual survey of school meal programs and hearing from the provinces and territories about their progress and documenting that um, to keep sharing those successes across the country. And currently I'm at the University of Saskatchewan collaborating with Dr. Rachel Englestringer and countless researchers across Canada on a national study looking to document an exemplary program in every province and territory to really shed the light on how different models can work in different contexts and how we can build towards a national school food program. So with all of that being said, one of the reasons for the conversation today and inviting in some researchers that we'll shortly hear from is that while there have been leaps and bounds in school food research in Canada, and I can thank many of my colleagues who are working diligently at that every day, um, we don't have the same benefit of the same length of programming and the longitudinal studies that other nations who've been doing this for decades before us have. So that's why we're going to bring in two researchers, one from the USA and one from Sweden, to share about their findings. And we will start with Dr. Juliana Cohen from Harvard University today. She is a researcher based in the USA, and she will present some of the great wide ranging benefits of the impact of universal preschool meals from her systematic review. Now we will play the six minute presentation from Dr. Juliana Cohen. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Juliana Cohen, and I'm a professor of nutrition, as well as the director of the Center for Health Inclusion Research and Practice, also known as CHIRP at Merrimack College, as well as in the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today about universal free school meals, including the benefits, as well as the lessons learned from a perspective of the United States. First, I'd like to share the results with you of one of our systematic reviews. This looked at the benefits of universal free school meals and was an international review of the literature. And we found a number of findings when looking at universal free school meal policies. The first was really around the impacts on child well-being as well as academics. And so first, one of the key findings around universal free school meals is the strong association with increased school meal participation, as well as school meal consumption. And what's really interesting here is what we found in the United States, for example, is that even children who are already eligible for free meals through our school meal program um, are more likely to participate 
when it's free for all children. It reduces the stigma associated with school meals, really highlighting one of the key benefits of universal free school meal policies. Additionally, um, universal free school meals is associated with improvements in child diet quality, particularly when this policy is combined with strong nutrition standards, as well as improvements in food security. And then additionally, this policy is associated with improvements in school attendance as well as academic performance. What's particularly interesting here, for example, with academic performance is that research has found that overall all children benefit from a universal free school meal policy, but those from who are from lower income households improve the most. So what's really exciting about a universal free school meal policy is that all children are benefiting while also reducing disparities that we see in children's health as well as academic outcomes. Additionally, there are impacts on households and finances as well. So our research has also found that a universal free school meal policy is associated with increased financial resources for SAMP families, which can be particularly important for those who are from low income households. Additionally, our research has found that universal free school meal policies substantially reduce family stress. Even things like figuring out what a child is going to eat in the morning for breakfast, figuring out what to serve it, bring um, to school for lunch, it substantially reduces the stress among all households, regardless of income, and then particularly among those who are from lower income households, where there's that additional strain of can they afford to feed their child. A universal preschool meal policy also can support local agriculture within a country, as well as provide increased labor and employment opportunities within the school as well. Some additional lessons learned that we've seen from our research specifically here in the United States um, that are policies that can be important complements to universal free school meal policies, including strong nutritional standards that provide general guidelines, but also important flexibility to ensure the cultural appropriateness as well as the palatability of school meals, now, thereby being able to really supply healthier foods that children will actually eat and meet the needs of diverse children across the country. Additionally, one common challenge that we see with universal free school meals is that because of the increased participation, this can lead to longer wait times on the lunch line. And so what our research has found is that policies that ensure students have sufficient time to eat, such as 30 minute lunch breaks, can ensure that all students have time to actually eat the healthier school meal. Additionally, in the United States, the schools that provide breakfast, we've often found that what we call alternative breakfast models, um, such as breakfast in the classroom initiative, grab and go options in the hallways, that can be really effective in ensuring that all children can also receive a healthy breakfast and be able to um, really be able to focus throughout the day. And then lastly, we've also found that when schools limit the sale of what we call competitive foods, these are any type of snacks or beverages that can be sold in schools, such as in vending machines, on the lunch line, foods that are sold outside of the school meal program, they literally can compete with school meals. And it also creates a two-tiered system where there are children who can afford the snacks and those children from lower income households who can't. And so again, there can be a lot of stigma and shame associated with that. And so overall, our research has found that by limiting the sale of competitive foods, it helps instead promote the school meal program. And in fact, we see increases in school meal participation when these snacks are limited. Thank you so much for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our research and the perspective from the United States. If you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to email me at jcohen at hsph.harvard.edu. Thank you. Amberly, I wanted to just give you a minute to share any comments or thoughts you have about that program, about the, um, the research they're doing there. Yeah, I really enjoyed Juliana's presentation because it really emphasized the war, the wide breadth of opportunities that are come with universal free school meals. 
as well as some really practical tips for increasing student participation in school meals and really complementary policies that support those programs. And we'll hear a bit later from another uh, American colleague about more of these insights, but I just thought it was a really good overview about the benefits of universal free school meals and also some of the policies that complement this program. Yeah, so next we will turn to our second researcher, and this is a Swedish researcher. His name is Dr. Dan Olaf Ruth, who is an economist from Stockholm University in Sweden. He will present some fascinating results on the economic impact of introducing universal free school meals on the increased lifetime earnings of students over multiple years and decreased social inequity as a result of implementing their new school meal program many, many years ago. Um, so now we will watch uh, Dr. Ruth's presentation, which is will be about 10 minutes long. Roll the film, thank you. Uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to give uh, this short pitch of, of our paper. Uh, it's uh, called Long-Term Effects of Childhood Nutrition, Evidence uh, from a School Lunch Reform. And here I added Swedish, uh, so you know that what context we're, so we are. We are in Sweden. And from the pictures, you can also tell that we are back in the days. And that's why we can estimate these long-term effects of childhood nutrition. So Sweden implemented this reform back in the 50s and 60s. And you also see some pictures here of the scientific paper that's to the left. And then we have several uh, popular versions of that that you, if you go to my homepage, so I'm Daniel of Root out of Stockholm University. And if you go to my homepage there, you can all find these uh, these popular versions as well to download. Okay, so this paper uh, throughout 46 to 69, Swedish municipalities gradually introduced this free, nutritious oriented uh, school lunches to all children in primary education. So this was a universal reform uh, impacting everyone. Uh, and back in 1960, Sweden was a rich country and belonged to the top five in terms of GDP per capita. If we look at poverty rates, they were the same as of today. So I think uh, that that it should be like relevant for if we go forward to think about what would be the long term effect of, of school lunches as today. Um, OK, so what were the school meals before and after the reform? Well, we have pretty good evidence here. We have these uh, books going back in before the, the school uh, reform or the school lunch reform. And it's not like statistics, but they have storytelling. So. It clearly, our best guess is they had milk, bread, and cheese. Uh, not all everyone had that, so some missed out on the cheese, some missed out on the milk. But on average, I think milk, bread, and cheese was what they had before. After the reform, there were pretty strict requirements, or really strict requirements. So for the quantity, that it should be enough calories for growth, so around 800 calories. But the main thing was the the quality stuff. So it should cover one third to half of daily dozens doses of nutrition but also a lot of different vitamins. And it was even so clear, so they, for proteins, they say like 32 grams, for iron, seven milligrams, and vitamins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they also had like a third thing that should be tasty, so the kids really wanted to eat these lunches. So if we think that it should be like a prepared and warm main course, and why I put it in red, is because they also had milk, bread, and cheese. So the treatment here is really going beyond milk, bread, and cheese to have the prepared warm and main course. So that's what I think is, is the thing that's uh, the treatment here. Of course, these municipalities had a hard time knowing, okay, how do we know that it's, it's this much uh, protein, how much vitamins, et cetera. And then the government really helped out in education programs. And what they really helped was these three week lunch uh, templates. So in, in the back you see in Swedish, but then I have this popular version um, so for Monday, you would get like smoked uh, sausage, boiled cabbage or other vegetable, tomato sauce and potatoes. And then Wednesday, you had pan fried fish fillets, lemon, potatoes and fruit. And then it goes on and on. And you had all these like really, really healthy food. And, and that's how they implemented these, uh, these uh, quality requirements. Then when I turned to the implementation of the school uh, school lunch program, uh, it was a gradual implementation. This is to the right. It's part of Sweden. Uh, and the colored ones, that's municipality where they implemented in different time periods. So we had to go into the archives and look, okay, when, or I didn't do it, but my uh, assistants did, go into the archives, look what year and where they implemented this. 
so then we know exactly uh, where to look for people. So the next step is like, okay, who lived in those municipalities? Who went to school in those municipalities in those years? Um, and that is uh, due to the Swedish register data, we can actually, and, and personal ID numbers, we can actually follow people over time um, and, and put them in these. So we have registered the total population, age, sex, ethnicity. We know where they live from the censuses of 60, 65, and 70, because we have their parents' place of living. And then we can also follow this individual through their uh, income and taxation registers. So we have incomes all the way from 68 to 2011. So that will be my measure as we I proceed, my lifetime income or my permanent income. And then we have education register. We have military enlistment data. Then we get height on, on, on males. Uh, and then we have the birth register. Then we get height of women. And that's, yeah, I, I come back to that. And then a bunch of health registers. So this is this new, new, uh, unique opportunity that we have with the registers. We can actually look at these long run, uh, long run outcomes. And now I'll turn directly to the main results, and the lifetime income increased by three percent. So I'll give you like a hint of what's going on here. So on the x-axis you see the number of years with the school lunch, and if it's nine, uh, the nine means that you, when they implemented the school lunch, you were in first grade. So then you were actually treated by school lunch for all of your nine years of compulsory schooling. And in that case, you had 3% higher income. That's on the y-axis. Then if you were in, in ninth grade when they implemented, so then you would only have one year of, of school lunch, then you see it's basically zero. And it's zero for even if you have two years or three years, so then it starts to kick in at, at, after four years. So it seems like you need a few years of school lunches for it to, to, to make an impact. But from then on, it's, it's a pretty straight on uh, increase. We can also look at heterogeneity by household income. So here we do it by quartiles. So you look at the, the poorest, uh, the, the kids from the poorest uh, household to the left, that's Q1. And their effect was the increase in, in earnings is about 6%. What's interesting here is that you see for, for Q2 to Q4, the highest so Q4 is the richest household. They have a similar impact as the other quartiles. So it's really uh, a, a universal effect here. Uh, so you can wonder here, if, should you do it for all? Or here in, in the Swedish case, it really seemed like even the richest kids did not know exactly how to, to eat in the best ways. But the most important result that we see here is, of course, that school lunch decreased inequalities uh, by socioeconomic background to, to, a, to a really great extent. Um, then when we turn to years of schooling, we see that that effect happened uh, instantaneously. As soon as you got more, more school lunches, your years of schooling uh, really improved. And this is responsible for about 50% of the effect on income. So the, the story then is that these kids decided to invest in more years of schooling, which eventually led them to also have higher incomes. So that's how we think of that mediation effect. Then we also wonder what, what is the main mechanism here? Uh, and we think it's nutrition. And the reason is because we see that the height for both males and females actually increase almost up to a centimeter. So that increase is, is a pretty stark one and hints that it was not so much only about calories, but it really was the nutrition changes that, that in, improved the, the height here. Uh, I presented this a couple of times in the US, and they always talk about, well, if you start introducing school lunches, then your attendance will be high. So then I actually had to go back and, and, and collect uh, school attendance data uh, from back then. And we can find that the school attendance was very high, all like almost like up to 95% even before the reform. So it seems like kids in Sweden always went to school. Uh, so this is not the mechanism uh, uh, here. Uh, so we still think the nutrition stuff. And let me conclude by talking about the cost benefit calculations because most reforms actually have a positive value. So you, you, you start something that you think will be like beneficial and you, so the question is really about how beneficial compared to other programs. Um, and when we do this calculation, um, we find that the benefits, and benefits in this case, as you say, it's only the income. So it's not like it, instead of uh, doing crime and stuff, we don't, we don't have that type of benefits. We, we don't, so it's only about the benefit is only what, how your income increased. And then we have perfect uh, control all over the costs, the cost for food and cost for, for uh, uh, labor to, to pr produce this food. So here we see that the costs, uh, the benefits outperformed uh, the cost by a factor of seven for poor kids. 
Uh, and this is true also for the median kid by factor four. That means for every krona or every Canadian dollar that you put in, you got back four Canadian dollars or kronas. So it was really a, a, a lot of like, yeah, it was a really good reform. And when we compare that that calculation to some uh, other reforms that you might know of, so down here you have like the time axis. So the head start is not, and then the impact is on the y axis. So the head start was like okay, but then you had the pair preschool program and abecedarian program. Those were back in the sixties and seventies. There were selected groups uh, with bad health and so forth, uh, and this universal and very selected groups, as you say. And the, the Swedish school reform, which was universal, was almost as effective as that one. So my conclusion is that this, this reform really had a, a, yeah, a lot of bangs for the buck, so to speak. And that is uh, that concludes my presentation here. Thank you. I'm certain, Amberly, as a researcher, like the, having that type, of, those type of, of longitudinal data must just have been um, remarkable. And for for such a long time, like 1946, um, I'm curious, uh, any comments you have about that? Absolutely. I thought it was really fascinating to learn how they correlated that increase of nutrition, that change and dra dramatic increase in nutrition to lifetime earnings, right? Like really showcasing the long-term impact. And I think what I really want to emphasize is what one of the key findings was, is that for all students across all economic backgrounds, that was on average a 4x return mm -hmm. just on just on earnings. So that's not looking at the health, that's not looking at other things that could have been included in that study. And then for the lowest quartile of household income, so students from the lowest economic background, it was actually a 7x return. So if you think about how both was raised, it was raised and actually leveled to some degree because of that differential, that greater difference of that 7% increase. And I think that really had showcased how the school meal program in Sweden was actually something that helped reduce social inequity through a longitudinal impact of increasing lifetime earnings. So a really inspiring study and I really wanted sure. to share because um, not only was it that you know, piece of great evidence and, and perspective, but also at the very end, you might've missed how he compared that impact to other interventions, particularly targeted interventions, um, one which some people might know, the Head Start program, which is a nutrition program for ages three to five. Um, and that was a targeted program and the school lunch, um, universal school lunch program, not a targeted program, actually had twice the impact. So I think it just goes to showcase like why school meal programs is a worthy investment. And I was really grateful to have um, not only that research done, but also Dan to present it so well today to us all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we have a, a couple of special guests joining us um, and Amberly will, will be taking over as the moderator. So Joshna and Diane, could you please uh, join the webinar? Great. I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you both for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you. Um, so I'll just quickly give you an introduction for those that don't know you. And I will first um, present that these are two great leaders and practitioners in school food programming. And first we have Diane Golinski. And Diane is the Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations of the Michigan Department of Education. In addition to the child nutrition programs, she's responsible for the school health and safety programs, the Library of Michigan, financial management, and administrative law. Diane is a registered dietitian and, a and who is passionate about feeding and caring for our children uh, in school in the USA. Um, second is Joshna Mahra. Marha Raj, sorry, um, a chef and advocate and author of Take Back the Tray, Revolutionizing Food in Hospitals, Schools, and Other Institutions. Joshna works with communities, organizations, and institutions to build values-based food services that prioritize good food, hospitality, and sustainability. 
So I have the great pleasure of spending 20 minutes or so having a conversation with these two leaders and to ask them questions about their experiences and what we can learn from them. So to kick it off, I wanted to ask you both a little bit, um, you know, tell us about what brought you to the work around school food programming and why it is important to you. So how about we start with you, Joshna? Okay, wonderful. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here with you. Uh, Emily, thanks for that intro. And Diane, it's lovely to share space with you. I'm very excited about hearing about what you're doing. Uh, so from my perspective, I my entry into the world of school food came by the fact that I was already deep in it with hospital food, uh, right? I was working in hospitals around Toronto uh, and there was a university campus that uh, had students complaining wonderfully about the food and the pot boiled over and they needed help. So they reached out to me and thus became the beginning of my identity as the institutional food lady, uh, which is sweet and I will take it. It's very nice. Uh, one of the things that I really focus on though is because I've had time uh, to really get into it on a university campus, I really focused on post-secondary student food security. I really, I feel like post-secondary students are a bit of a forgotten population. We don't understand that they are very much on a fixed income uh, and need support in a way that, uh, that we are not really offering. And so I like to talk about my focus on school food as a pitch to think about them from K to PhD. Uh, right to go beyond K to 12 or K to right we have to think the broader sense uh, and part of what keeps me going here is that I have seen the dramatic positive changes that happen when a campus has a good food culture right I've literally seen better food injected into a system uh, really literally reanimate the campus and bring the people to some degree back to life again. Uh, we saw this, uh, I have you know, history in community food security and we see this very much happening at the grassroots level, but there's some wonderful thing that happens on campuses, in schools, when uh, uh, it's, it's it, and we'll talk more about the fact that it's beyond just putting good food on the plates and filling tanks. It's about the whole culture of food that exists in the place. And so that's the angle that I take it from. And uh, it's it's just so worthwhile that I the fire will continue and I'll keep pushing. Awesome. Thanks so much, Josh. Now we'll come back to you in a moment to yes. hear more about your expertise. So I'm going to ask Diane now to share a bit about your school food story and what got you into the work that you do now. I'm happy to. Thank you so much for having me here. It is just wonderful to be here. So my story is a little different than Joshna's in that I have always been fascinated with food and the role that food plays in a body and in a family and culture. And growing up, I heard a lot about my dad and what it was like for him growing up, not knowing where his next meal would come from. So I never experienced hunger, but I knew very clearly that my dad had. And our home was such that we had an abundance of food, but you would see my dad literally wrap his arms around the food and eat as fast as he could because that was something that had been ingrained in him uh, for his entire life. And at the end of his life, through a series of medical complications, he actually lost his ability to chew and swallow. And so I was at this point, I had become a dietitian. I knew about nutrition. I knew that we could find ways to keep him alive. But he pulled my siblings and I together and he said, I can't go through that again. It had been 60 years since he had ever known hunger, but it was still so real to him that he chose death over any other option because he could not stand the thought of knowing hunger again in his life. And so from that point forward, I just became really passionate about making sure that kids didn't need to feel hungry. In the world that we live in as adults caring for kids, we can find ways to make this happen. And so I went to work for our Department of Education in the school meals program, and I worked my way up to a leadership position in, in, in an effort to try to make a difference in the world of kids. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Diane. That's always very sure. powerful to hear. 
So I want to stick with you now, Diane, for you to share about the good news of recently. You know, Michigan, amongst other states, have recently committed to offering universal free school meals, um, transitioning away from traditional three-tiered model in the U.S., and maybe you want to share a bit about that for those that aren't aware. But if you could tell us more about this great news and also a bit about the key levers that made this possible from your perspective and the impacts you are seeing right now, or maybe might expect to continue to see into the future because of this shift. I'd be happy to. So as you noted, what we have in the US with our national school lunch and school breakfast programs is a three tiered model where families needed to disclose their income. And then based on that income, they either qualified for free meals or a reduced price meal, or they had to pay for meals. So in the state of Michigan, we have a law that says every public school must offer the meals, but the families either paid or did not based on their family income in order for the children to eat those meals at school. And so one of the things that we saw as a challenge was that there were kids who fell through the cracks. It was a very definitive line. And if as a family, you made $1 more per year than what that line said, then you went from either having to pay for meals or not just by that $1 in a year. And what really happened for us, if you can even call the COVID pandemic a blessing, was that the blessing of the COVID pandemic was that we eliminated that three-tier model as a nation and said, all meals are free. During this pandemic, all meals are free. And what we saw was a dramatic decrease in child poverty and in food insecurity. We saw children who were attending school and more active and more alert and more able to learn at school because now they were They could count on being able to eat at school. Then in 22-23, so school year 22-23, that waiver went away and we went back to our three-tier model of feeding kids at school and we saw a dramatic decrease of children eating at school. Just here in the state of Michigan, we saw over 70,000 fewer breakfasts served every single day because of needing to go back to paying. And we saw school meal debt just explode. Some school districts had $100,000, $200,000 in school meal debt for kids who were eating meals, but families who couldn't pay for it. So that really drove our state legislature to say, hey, you know what, this three-tier model isn't working. So we're going to invest in our kids and we're going to find a way to make it back to universal free for all of our kids. And that started here with this current school year. What we are seeing is a back to those COVID numbers of participation. Kids are eating at school again. Families are calling us and saying, thank you for this. We we, um, have calculated about $850 per child in savings each year for the families for what they don't have to pay for kids, their kids eating for free at school. Amazing, thank you so much for sharing that. So 850 US dollars, which- Correct, know, that's right. Significantly. That's right. <laughs> uh, or in Canadian dollars for those 10 months of the school year, right? Yes. So that would be money that families can spend elsewhere. Absolutely. That's within. right. So that definitely has an impact. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I just wanted a quick follow-up question for those that might have this burning question. How did that cost sharing between the supplement that's coming from the federal government, from the USDA, um, how does that roughly match with what the state's putting in for how that's done? So the way that we structured it is the federal program is still in place. So Mm -hmm. school districts are still getting all of the same federal reimbursement that they were getting before. There is a federal program called community eligibility provision, where if a school district has a um, certain amount of poverty within their district, they qualify under that federal program to serve every meal for free anyway. So that became a requirement in our state. We had some districts who qualified but didn't participate. Now they have to participate in that federal program. 
And so the state program really comes in and supplements where the federal program doesn't. So if the school district didn't qualify for the federal program, now the state comes in and pays that um, reimbursement difference for those districts. So every child is eating for free under some combination of either the state or the federal program. Okay, got you. Thank you. Now we're going to go over to Joshna and bring her into the conversation. Um, so Joshna, you have extensive experience in inst institutional food procurement. So I really wanted to have you share at this time about what are some of the key insights that maybe you could translate from your, your work um, to elementary and secondary schools? This could be anything from, you know, infrastructure to uh, labor, anything that you think, you know, could offer some insight into, you know, how to do things well and, and how school food programs can succeed. Mm -hmm, thank you. First, I have to mention, Diane, I love the note um, about your, like what you've suggested here is cooperation between state level politics and federal level politics. And if only we could all get our act together for, you know, and if we in Canada could have that relationship between the province and the nation, uh, I feel like everybody would live more nourished, healthy, wholesome lives. Uh, that is, to me, that's like the biggest wisdom, right? Is that bit of cooperation. And especially when the municipality is sort of the, the, the final, delivery arm on this. It could be great. And thank you for, for reminding us of that. Um, okay, so on to your question. Thank you. One of the things, uh, I feel it's important to articulate this, and that regardless of the school and the level of education we're talking about, we really need to think about school food programming as more than simply putting food on plates for students, right? Of course, that's the top of the list. And of course, that is the, you know, the biggest fire but students need an entire culture of food on that campus. And this is about, in like in hospitals, we see this around like, is our meal times protected, uh, right? And or are patients pulled to lab tests and x-rays and all this kind of stuff. And then the lunches get cold and then potentially return to the kitchen. But in schools, it's the same thing. There was a time actually where uh, many schools on varying of varying levels did not schedule classes between 12 and 1 p.m., right? There was this notion that everybody needed to stop and eat lunch uh, or share a meal together. And this is what we're talking about around culture, uh, right? And 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 the, the role, the, how food lives in a school on a campus. Other pieces are things like, how easy is it for students to get their hands on food? Can they, are these cafes open? Are cafeteria spaces open? Until like one of the things, I was actually just talking to a student group yesterday, and their complaint was that their particular program has many, many evening classes, but all the cafeterias close an hour before their classes end. So they cannot get dinner three or four nights a week on campus, right? These are the, it's a little left hand, right hand, not connecting to uh, what is happening on the campus and what students are doing. Similarly, students with lots of morning classes complain about the fact that the cafes aren't open early enough. Uh, right, for them to get in there to get some breakfast or grab a something to head over to class. And so this, this is what we mean by the culture of campus. Is there time and space for students to actually enjoy food? Uh, and then the other piece is a little connected to procurement. And that is how are we using our resources in the school? What are we investing in? What type of agriculture? Culture, what type of food production. I have really clear, like, this is very anecdotal, but I had two and a half years on a university campus in Toronto, and we purchased food thoughtfully with the values that sort of I articulated. And after two and a half years, we calculated that we had spent $2 million thoughtfully on locally produced, sustainably grown food, which was it was a giant investment in local agriculture, right? And there's a way, again, this culture is uh, where a school or an institution can build relationships with small business, with local agriculture, because really our institutions should be able to bolster our local business, right? We should, we should be able to work together more thoughtfully and really show students the fact that the community around them the community of producers, of farmers, of cheesemakers, of, you know, wh whoever it is, are all invested in taking care of them and nourishing them. Like there's, it's a much tidier equation that we can build. And I've seen it ha happen, which is why I won't let this go. Thank you. 
you so much for sharing that, Josh. Now, it's always a great reminder of the purchasing power of institutions and particularly school meal programs. Um, you know, one of the statements that was made in Paris when I was there for the Global School Meals Summit was that schools globally are actually the largest purchasers of, of public food. And just think of how we can shift the food system if we're able to That's place the values that we want behind our purchases, right? So a huge potential for, you know, creating the kind of food system that we want to have by having specialized contracts and relationships with the food system that we want to have created. So really key insights. Thank you so much, Joshna, for sharing that. Um, so next I wanna go to, uh, to hear from both of you in terms of what is your best elevator pitch for policymakers, why we should invest in school meals. You know, I know you both touched on this a bit. You know, I would just love like your, your 30 second elevator pitch or however long, um, but try to keep it short, like why this should happen in Canada and what impact this could have. There are some policymakers on the call today and I would love to hear from you what, what that is. So whoever would like to start, I'll let you jump in. Joshna, would you like to start? Sure, I will. Okay. I, I'll make a Canadian plea from a Canadian, yes. Uh, so here's the pitch. It's a twofold point, I think. For me, Canada needs a national school food program because their kids are struggling, right? Straight up and down, they're not doing well. Uh, and it should not be up to very kind teachers, parents, and volunteers to create shoestring programs to put some food in students bellies so they're able to focus and pay attention in class right in Ontario the province that I live in it was teachers using their money to buy granola bars because they saw they could hear the echo right of the empty bellies as students came into their classrooms uh, the other piece is we need to understand that students need to learn about food the most effective version of a national school food pro program will also include food literacy promotion, uh, right? The, it's it's got to be a holistic piece. Um, and listen, we invest this way and we just watch our kids thrive. Thank you. I so agree. Go ahead, I was, sure. So for me, I, I use three points as well. I usually talk about, we put children in space and expect them to learn but they can't learn if all they're thinking about is food and when their next, where their next meal is going to come from. We are addressing school, uh, we are addressing food insecurity. We are addressing their ability to become well-educated, contributing adult members of society. And we are also addressing healthcare because we are teaching them what a great healthy meal that's locally sourced looks like so that they can then build their meals themselves as they become adults. I often will, um, I have been known to have meetings with adults where I tell them that I'm going to feed them breakfast and then I don't. And then an hour after they've been hearing a speaker, I ask them how much they remember about what that speaker had to say. And I point out that that's what our kids deal with when they come to school hungry. They can't listen to the teacher if they're hungry. Thanks so much, Diane. Really good points. And just to wrap up or maybe to offer another you know, uh, pitch to all of this is that we know both in Canadian research and internationally that students across the socioeconomic spectrum don't eat as well as what they need to be, right? So this isn't a socioeconomic problem to one particular class. It's just we have food systems that are inundated by highly processed foods. And this is a challenge wherever, you, whatever your background is. So the need to teach about food, uh, food literacy and where our food comes from is, is really pertinent and important. So really great points, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to continue this conversation and I'm going to pull up the questions that were asked in the chat and facilitate an ongoing conversation about, uh, about school meals. So to start, I wanted to turn to a question, I believe, from Evan Frazier, who is the director of the Errol Food Institute, and he asks a question about um, food insecurity and vulnerability. Uh, he, sorry, I think there's two questions from Evan. 
He's asking, uh, I agree that post-secondary students are really vulnerable to food insecurity, especially international students who are often of the, the least in the way of community support. Um, Guelph has a lot of student-run programs, but they are a drop in the ocean, alas. Um, so some, some comments and you know, thoughts and reflections about you know, measuring food security and about how school meals can benefit. Maybe um, if you, whoever would like to start to talk about the impact of school meals and, and food insecurity. Diana, I'm interested to what you have to say here. I would, I'd love for sure. you to take the lead on this one. So our, in, in the US, our school food program addresses breakfast and lunch. We have a secondary program that will offer a third meal, but it's during the school day. And so we don't have a ton of programs that deal with weekends or school breaks or holidays. And so that's where the, what we call the food safety net comes in because we have the supplemental nutrition program, which are for families in need, which is meant to bring in additional funds into the family to cover those days in which kids don't have access through their um, formal school program. But in terms of um, measuring household food insecurity, I don't, I don't know how that's done. I have to admit, I don't know how that's done other than um, anecdotal stories. Uh, so one of the things that that we have in uh, in Canada, I think it's not just the province of Ontario, is we do uh, we do uh, some surveying and people uh, self identify, uh, right? And we ask questions like how many you know how long how many how many days a week do you go without a meal or you know questions like this or you know what level of security do you have in the morning about what you'll eat in the evening or you know this kind of stuff, um, and so the numbers are staggering. Uh, right. And particularly in Canada, that context, the 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 level, like I think we're sitting at like between 13 and 17 percent food insecurity. And that number jumps to early, you know, low 50s when we think about northern communities uh, and super compounded when we think about kids. Uh, right. And how that all comes into play. And so I think that like for me, one of the most important messages that I saw from the U.S. during the pandemic was that kids perhaps we're not missing the education from school as much as they were missing the meals from school, right? And we saw, I saw beautiful things about teachers and administrators driving meals around and dropping things off on people's front steps just to try and, you know, close these gaps. And so um, I think that we, like, soon enough, I feel like we're going to hit a critical mass around food insecurity. And we're going to realize that this is an issue that needs to be addressed from a much wider perspective because, there's so many factors contributing to a community's food insecurity, right? We need to think about the quality of the jobs that exist. We need to think about what kind of childcare is available. Like all of these pieces contribute to community food security. And so I feel like the biggest vulnerability around this is that we don't think about this holistically enough. We think food banks and cans of non-perishable food and, yeah. off, and you know, job done. A little yeah. bit of charity three times a year and we're good. Uh, right when really the issue that we are all seeing is the the perpetual impact of kind of broken systems, uh, right? That really force families into a level of need that is perhaps not necessary, uh, right? Uh, because it's wonderful that we can have that. You know, Diane just told about uh, the food safety net. What a glorious thing! But we should all also think about what does it mean for a community when the school is now a child's primary source of nutrition, right? The home used to be a child's primary source of nutrition, but that is not the case. Now it is the school. And that is simply emerged because teachers recognize that kids cannot pay attention when their tummies are empty, uh, right? And we need to talk about that more, right? We, it's wonderful to have these programs and for sure, right? This is the kind of curious piece about food security is that you need to advocate broadly for system change while also making sure that people get at least one meal a day, right? It's, it's a macro micro work happening at the same time, uh, which is necessary, but, but the, I, the much harder, more complicated road to take, let's just say that. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Doshna. I think what 
yeah, what you said really underscored for me is that the multiple supports that I really needed to, to help reduce food insecurity and from Diane's experience in the U.S., you know, showcasing that access to universal free school meals saved families $850 U.S. dollars per student emphasized how that money can be redirected towards the food budgets within the home, right? And, and we do know, as you mentioned, Joshna, we need a wraparound of supports. We need yes. um, income-based supports. We need to make sure there's livable wages. Um, and when schools are not in session, we need other sources, right? In the U.S., you have a variety of programs, of after-school programs and summer programs that also provide those supports. So I'm not sure if you want to allow elaborate on that at all, Diane, and the role that plays, but I'll just note that that is something the U.S. offers as well. You're absolutely right, and it, it's incredible when I think about um, before we had the COVID pandemic and we would talk about the idea of universal free meals, we talked about 365 days of reliable access to good, healthy meals, and how that is a basic human right, as basic as the access to clean water, because no one should be able to, or should have to worry about where their next meal is coming from. And so we do have a variety of different programs that create that safety net. We have the summer programs that are available. We have a new program starting next year, which will provide a food voucher benefit to families who are in rural areas and have a harder time getting to a congregate on-site feeding location for summer meals for kids. We have um, some um, after-school programs, supper program types of things, but then really just as humans, remembering that as adults, we have more options than our kids do. And the last time I knew a five-year-old didn't have the resources or the wherewithal to go find food when they needed food, it's up to us as adults to remember that our kids don't have the same access unless we make the effort to provide that for them. Great, thank you so much. Um, next, I wanna go to a question that is for you, Diane. Um, there's more questions about the details of Michigan's program, and it's an anonymous attendee that wrote and said, does Michigan's program include targeted tax measures to recover costs for school food? They're curious because we've seen this in a few other places. So any insights into mechanisms around sure. funding? At this time, that is not the case in Michigan. The state legislature decided to invest um, state tax dollars that were already coming in. So there's not a separate tax measure to cover it. I do know there are a couple of other states that did implement a separate tax measure to cover the cost of being able to provide meals at no cost to all students across the state. But in Michigan, the state legislature took the funds that were already coming in and decided to allocate the portion needed to cover the cost of the meals. Awesome. Great insights. And is there anything in additional, I'm not sure if you followed the other states and how they've done their funding mechanisms, but if there were any that you did follow, is there any insight you could offer us in terms of how that funding mechanism was done? Sure. So the state of Colorado is using a higher income tax bracket. So if a family makes more than $400,000 US dollars a year, then they actually have a higher tax rate. And that additional tax is used to cover the cost of the meals across that state. Um, Massachusetts did a similar type of uh, measure, but there's their tax was set up differently. I can't remember exactly how it was, but there was a separate tax to cover the cost. Um, I'm not sure, there's there's a total of eight states that have provided um, free, free access to free meals to all students, and I'm not sure how the others are funded. Great, thank you so much for that additional insight. 
Um, next, I'm going to go to a question uh, for both of you to respond to, and this is definitely an ongoing conversation and, and challenge in Canada. And this is, um, the question is, do you feel that there's a place for for-profit businesses to get involved with school meals, or does this strictly need to be solved by governments and nonprofits? We, we know from the U.S.'s history, there's been a long history of actually the challenge of corporate capture of school meals. So, but how do we balance this with maybe uh, um, industry playing, can they, can they help solve some problems or is it a dangerous territory and maybe something that, um, yeah, there's some concerns. So how do, how do we balance this and, and what are some solutions or your, your thoughts on, um, yeah, who, who should be taking the lead on this? That's a okay. great I'll question. In. Please. I have, uh, I have some strong opinions, uh, about all of this primarily i believe if students are food insecure any the administrations have the responsibility to address this issue right so they that's that's one piece um and i do think there is space for for profit uh businesses to be involved but not with the same numbers and not with the same expectations i think that's really where things start falling apart is we want to pull the same end like every we all know that the margins in this industry are negligible um right so yes for profit but not as much profit perhaps or maybe we rethink where profits come from in this context right because we have seen their brigade is a, is a, um, a system running in the us uh you know founded by a chef uh, who's gotten into school boards and, and figured out a way to make things work. They're essentially a for-profit company, um, but they what their expectations for what they pull out of that financial transaction are different, uh, right? They have priorities around caring for students and using good, wholesome, locally sourced ingredients. Uh, and so there is room there, uh, right, for partnerships. And I've, I've, I've attempted to wrangle this myself on a campus uh, to make this work. Because unfortunately, what we see, because I live in the land of public health care and public education, is that when, when left to government, uh, it is the lowest common denominator. You know what I mean? The bar is very, very low. And we need, we in these spaces, we need some of the fire and excitement of for-profit business to push our thinking a little bit and to push innovation and ideas um, that that potentially just don't move around. Uh, and listen, nonprofit organizations are already overstretched, uh, right? We cannot dump this on them as well, uh, right? They are pre-pandemic, they were threadbare, uh, and now there's just big gaping holes. Uh, so the notion that we would add this to their pile just feels unfair at this point in the game. Um, and so primarily, I think the responsibility to sort this out should come from the administration. And in Canada, that, that's a public government responsibility. Uh, but I, I would love to see more innovation and openness to redefining what corporate part and you know what business partnerships could in fact look like. Because look, my, my local farmers, those are all small businesses. Those are all small yeah. for-profit businesses. And they have a place at the table. We just need to redefine the terms. Thanks so much for sharing that, Joshna. I really enjoyed your remark about maybe there's a way that some of the innovations from business can inspire. There can be lessons learned maybe about food supply chains and other ways of working. And also noting that you said the small farmer is a business, right? Um, so finding maybe some good safeguards and mechanisms is a way that there could be a relationship that is suitable for, for everyone. And I just wanted to interject here um, just to note that um, nonprofits actually across Canada are the number one leaders of delivering school meal programs, and it's amazing to see what they are doing. But I, your point is well taken that more support is needed and more collaboration. So um, I'll stop there and turn it over to Diane. I agree with everything. I love the idea, Joshna, of innovation and really looking at how we do this differently. I think for us, it has always fallen to the government's responsibility to take care of those who haven't found a way to be able to take care of themselves, right? And how to level that playing field. And so that's where it really fell for us. When, when you first started talking, I kept thinking, well, if for-profit businesses had the will to do this, why haven't they stepped up before this? But I love the idea of 
really thinking innovatively and trying to make a difference. And I also love your comment about um, small farmers being businesses and for-profit businesses. One of the things that we have implemented in our state is an incentive program to purchasing from Michigan farmers. So Michigan grown produce, we are a large producer of dry beans. And so fruits, vegetables, and dried beans, when those are included in a school meal, there's an additional reimbursement available for every meal served, which then benefits the farmers because we're sourcing more from our local farmers. It gives them a solid source of business. And it also gives our kids the ability to have access to great local food and understand where their food is coming from. Great. Thanks so much, Diane. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to respond to the question as well, because we've been wrestling with this as a research team across Canada. Um, as I mentioned, I'm at the University of Saskatchewan and looking at program models across the country. So I wanted to present, you know, just a few of those models to showcase that um, really, I think it's going to look different depending on what community assets are there. So for example, in Quebec, they have a great program called La Cantine Fortus, which is more of a B corporation or a social enterprise that partners with local caterers um, and they help deliver meals. So this is an example of working with, like I said, more of a social enterprise style of business to deliver meals. Um, and then you go over to Alberta when I spent some time there and they had a really neat innovation in an indigenous school board where they actually had a fully school food supply chain owned by the school district. So it was actually four school districts that came together, four indigenous school districts that came together to actually purchase their own trucks and have their own warehouse. And they actually managed all of that food supply. And it was a really great example of a community owned and school owned school food supply chain. And because of this, they actually created their own jobs within their school district. So they had students working, students and new staff working in the food hub or the, the food warehouse. They had staff you know, running the trucks and that was one model that worked really well for them. And they also shared that that was really important part of um, indigenous food sovereignty for them to actually have control over their supply chains and to go seek products from um, uh, also fellow indigenous uh, communities that were producing that product. So that was like a really inspiring example where it actually really empowered the community and that investment in the infrastructure was, was an amazing outcome. Um, and then just to quickly wrap up on uh, the new lunch program in PEI, they were really curious about these different models and options as well, as well working with industry um, or doing it in-house. So they actually pursued three different prongs. They pursued first, um, you know, having their own centralized production facility. They also pursued um, caterers. So uh, caterers that were for-profit small businesses. And then thirdly, they had on-site production within the school where students were involved with preparing the meals and um, you know, led by a, a well-trained chef. And that was just really neat. And they're still working through which has been the most um, economical. Um, but these are, I think, some of the things that we just need to keep reevaluating, both as practitioners and as researchers, to find what is the best fit for that particular community and scale. So um, no shortage of really great options. And I know there'll be a diversity of solutions to make this come together for Canada. Yeah, Incredible. wonderful. Just noting the time and we're om almost at 1.15, I'm going to have to wrap up, but this has been a really engaging conversation and there's a slew of questions and maybe we can turn them to you later on after if you have time to answer them. But um, just I just really want to thank everyone, both of you for joining us live for this really engaging conversation and to the other researchers that were able to pre-record their presentations. It really made for a great webinar today. Um, so on that note, I have a few other concluding remarks. I also just wanted to um, send a very big thank you to the Errol Family Foundation for making this work possible, and especially Laura Errol, who is in the audience today, for making this possible. Um, I would also like to promote the upcoming Errol Food Institute Summit. The reminder is that if you want to keep engaged with the Errol Food Institute and all of the great things that are happening, the next big event is the Errol Food Summit coming up on November 14th. 
and you can visit arrowfoodsummit.ca to learn more about how you can join us in person or online. Thank you so much everyone for coming today and for your engaging questions and comments to join in a really important conversation about school food in Canada.